I sit on a cushion as an imp braids my hair back from my face. The imp's fingers are long, her nails sharp. I wince. Her black eyes meet mine in the claw-footed mirror on my dressing table. The tournament is still four nights away, the creature says. Her name is Deterful, and she's a servant in Maddox's household, stuck here until she works off her debt to him. She's cared for me since I was a child. It was Deterful who smeared stinging fairy ointment over my eyes to give me true sight so that I could see through most glamours, who brushed the mud from my boots, and who strung dried ruin berries for me to wear around my neck so I might resist enchantments. She wiped my wet nose and reminded me to wear my stockings inside out, so I'd never be led astray in the forest. And no matter how eager you are for it, you cannot make the moon set nor rise any faster. Try to bring glory to the general's household tonight by appearing as comely as we can make you. I sigh. She's never had much patience with my peevishness. It's an honor to dance with the High King's court under the hill. The servants are over fond of telling me how fortunate I am. A bastard daughter of a faithless wife, a human without a drop of fairy blood, to be treated like a trueborn child of fairy. They tell Taran much the same thing. I know it's an honor to be raised alongside the gentry's own children. A terrifying honor, of which I will never be worthy. It would be hard to forget it, with all the reminders I am given. Yes, I say instead, because she is trying to be kind, it's great. Fairies can't lie. So they tend to concentrate on words and ignore tone, especially if they haven't lived among humans. Toturfel gives me an approving nod, her eyes like two wet beads of jet, neither pupil nor iris visible. Perhaps someone will ask for your hand and you will be made a permanent member of the High Court. I want to win my place, I tell her. The ant pauses, hairpin between her fingers, probably, considering pricking me with it. Don't be foolish. There is no point in arguing, no point to reminding her of my mother's disastrous marriage. There are two ways for mortals to become permanent subjects of the court marrying. Into it are honing some great skill in metallurgy or loot playing, or whatever. Not interested in the first, I have to hope I can be talented enough for the second. She finishes braiding my hair into an elaborate style that Makes me look as though I have horns. She dresses me in sapphire velvet. None of it disguises what I am human. I put in three knots for luck, the little fairy says, not unkindly. I sigh as she scuttles toward the door, getting up from my dressing table to sprawl face down on my tapestry-covered bed. I am used to having servants attend to me. Imps and hobs. Goblins and grigs. Gossamer wings and green nails. Horns and fangs. I have been in fairy for ten years. None of it seems all that strange anymore. Here, I am the strange one, with my blunt fingers, round ears, and mayfly life. Ten years is a long time for a human. After Maddox stole us from the human world, he brought us to his estates on Insmire, the Isle of Might, where the High King of Elfhain keeps his stronghold. There, Maddock raised Usman Vivian and Taryn out of an obligation of honor. Even though Taryn and I are the evidence of Mom's betrayal. By the customs of fairy, were his wife's kids, so were his problem.
As the High King's general, Madoc was away often, fighting, for the crown. We were well cared for nonetheless. We slept. On mattresses stuffed with the soft seed heads of dandelions. Madoc personally instructed us in the art of fighting with a cutlass and dagger, the falchion and our fists. He played nine. Men's Morris, Fitchell, and Fox and Geese with us before a fire. He let us sit on his knee and eat off his plate. Many nights I drifted off to sleep to his rumbling voice, reading from a book of battle strategy, and despite myself, despite what had done and what he was, I came to love him. I do love him. It's just not a comfortable kind of love. Nice braids, Taryn says, rushing into my room. She's dressed in crimson velvet. Her hair is loose along chestnut curls that fly behind her like a capelet, a few strands braided with gleaming silver thread. She hops onto the bed beside me, disarranging my small pile of threadbare stuffed in emulsa, koala, a snake, a black cattle beloved of my seven-year-old self. I cannot bear to throw out any of my relics. I sit up to take a self-conscious look in the mirror. I like them. I am having a premonition, Taryn says, surprising me. We're going to have fun tonight. Fun? I'd been imagining myself frowning at the crowd. From our usual bolt hole and worrying over whether I'd do well. Enough in the tournament to impress one of the royal family. Into granting me knighthood. Just thinking about it makes me fidgety, yet I think about it constantly. My thumb brushes over. The missing tip of my ring finger. My nervous tick. Yes, she says, poking me in the side. Hey. Now, I scoot out of range. What exactly does this plan entail? Mostly, when we go to court, we hide ourselves away. We've watched some very interesting things, but from a distance. She throws up her hands. What do you mean? What does fun entail? It's fun. I laugh a little nervously. You have no idea, either, do you? Fine. Let's go see if you have a gift for prophecy. We are getting older and things are changing. We are changing. And as eager as I am for it, I am also afraid. Taryn pushes herself off my bed and holds out her arm, as though she's my escort for a dance. I allow myself to be. Guided from the room, my hand going automatically to assure Myself that my knife is still strapped to my hip. The interior of Maddox's house is whitewashed plaster and massive, rough-cut wooden beams. The glass panes in the windows are stained gray as trapped smoke, making the light strange. As Taryn and I go down the spiral stairs, I spot Vivi, hiding in a little balcony, frowning over a comic scene stolen from the human world. Vivi grins at me. She's in jeans and a billowy shirt obviously not intending to go to the revel, being Maddox. Legitimate daughter, she feels no pressure to please him. She does what she likes, including reading magazines that might have iron staples rather than glue binding their pages, not caring if her fingers get singed. Heading somewhere she asks softly from the shadows, startling Taryn. Vivi knows perfectly well where we're heading. When we first came here, Taryn and Vivi and I would huddle in Vivi's big bed and talk about what we remembered from home. We'd talk about the meals Momburn and the popcorn Dad made, our next-door neighbors' names, the way the house smelled, what school was like, the holidays, the taste of icing on birthday cakes. We'd talk about the show as wed. Watched, rehashing the plots, recalling the dialogue until all our memories were polished smooth and false. There's no more huddling in bed now, rehashing anything, 
All our new memories are of here, and Vivi has only a passing interest in those. Shed vowed to hate Maddox, and she stuck to her vow. When Vivi wasn't reminiscing about home, she was a terror. She broke things. She screamed and raged and pinched us. When we were content. Eventually, she stopped all of it, but I believe there is a part of her that hates us for adapting, for making the best of things, for making this our home. You should come, I tell her. Terrence in a weird mood. Vivi gives her a speculative look and then shakes her head. I've got other plans, which might mean she's going to sneak over to the mortal world for the evening or it might mean she's going to spend it on the balcony, reading. Either way, if it annoys Maddox, it pleases Vivi. He's waiting for us in the hall with his second wife, Oriana. Her skin is the bluish color of scheme milk, and her hair is as. White as fresh fallen snow. She is beautiful but unnerving too. Look at, like a ghost. Tonight she is wearing green and gold. A mossy dress with an elaborate shining collar that makes the pink of her mouth, her ears, and her eyes stand out. Maddox. Is dressed in green, too. The color of deep forests. The sword. At his hip is no ornament. Outside. Past the open double doors, a hob waits, holding the silver bridles of five dappled fairy steeds, their manes, braided in complicated and probably magical knots. I think of the knots in my hair and wonder how similar they are. You both look well, Maddox says to Taryn and me, the warmth in his tone making the words a rare compliment. His gaze goes to the stairs. Is your sister on her way? I don't know where Vivi is, I lie. Lying is so easy here. Capital I. Can do it all day long and never be caught. She must have. Forgotten. Disappointment passes over Maddox's face, but not surprise. He heads outside to say something to the hob holding the reins. Nearby, I see one of his spies, a wrinkled creature with a nose like a parsnip and a back hunched higher than her head. She slips a note into his hand and darts off with surprising nimbleness. Oriana looks us over carefully as though she expects to find something amiss. Be careful tonight, Oriana says. Promise me you will neither eat nor drink nor dance. We've been to court before, I remind her, a fairy. Non-answer if ever there was one. You may think salt is sufficient protection, but you children are forgetful. Better to go without. As for dancing, once begun, you mortals will dance yourselves to death if we don't prevent it. I look at my feet and say nothing. We children are not forgetful. Maddock married her seven years ago, and shortly after, she gave him a child, a sickly boy named Oak, with tiny, adorable horns on his head. It has always been clear that Oriana puts up with me and Taryn only for Maddock's sake. She seems to think of us as her husband's favorite hounds poorly trained, and likely to turn on our master at any moment. Oak thinks of us as sisters, which I can tell makes Ariana nervous, even though I would never do anything to hurt him.
capital F. Aries are twilight creatures, and I have become one, too. We rise when the shadows grow long and head to our beds. Before the sun rises, it is well after midnight when we arrive at the great hill at the palace of Elfheim. To go inside, we must ride between two trees, an oak and a thorn, and then straight into what appears to be the stone wall of an abandoned folly. I've done it hundreds of times, but I flinch anyway. My whole body braces, I grip the reins hard, and my eyes mash shut. When I open them, I am inside the hill. We ride on through a cavern, between pillars of roots, over packed earth. There are dozens of the folk here, crowding around the entrance to the vast throne room, where court is being held long-nosed pixies with tattered wings, elegant, green-skinned ladies in long gowns with goblins holding up their trains, Trixie Boggins, laughing foxkin, a boy in an owl mask, and a golden headdress, an elderly woman with crows, crowding her shoulders, a gaggle of girls with wild roses in their hair, a bark-skinned boy with feathers around his neck, a group of knights all in scarab green armor, many I've seen before, a few I have spoken with, too many for my eyes to drink them all in, yet I cannot look away. I never get tired of this of the spectacle, of the pageantry. Maybe Oriana isn't entirely wrong to worry that we might one day get caught up in it, be carried away by it, and forget to Take care. I can see why humans succumb to the beautiful nightmare of the court, why they willingly drown in it. I know I shall love it as I do, stolen as I am from the mortal world, my parents murdered, but I love it all the same. Maddox swings down from his horse. Oriana and Taran are already off theirs, handing them over to grooms. It's me. They're waiting for. Maddox reaches out his fingers like he is, going to help me. But I hop off the saddle on my own. My leather slippers hit the ground like a slab. I hope that I look like a knight to him. Oriana steps forward, probably to remind Taryn and me of all the things she doesn't want us to do. I don't give her the chance. Instead, I hook my arm through Taryn's and hurry along inside. The room is redolent with burning rosemary and crushed herbs. Behind us, I can hear Maddox's heavy step, but... I know where I am going. The first thing we have to do when we get to court is greet the king. The high king Eldred sits on his throne in gray robes of state, a heavy golden oak leaf crown holding down his thin, spun gold hair. When we bow, he touches our heads lightly, with his knobby, bearinged hands, and then we rise. His grandmother was Queen Mab, of the house of the Greenbrier. She lived as one of the solitary fae before she began to conquer Faerie with her horned consort and his stag riders. Because of him, each of Eldred's six heirs are said to have some animal characteristic, a thing that is not unusual in Faerie but is unusual among the trooping gentry of the courts. The eldest prince, Balakin, and his younger brother, Dane, stand nearby, drinking wine from wooden cups banded in silver. Dane wears breeches that stop at his knees, showing his hoods and deer legs. Balakin wears the great goatee favors, with a collar of bear fur. His fingers have a thorn at each knuckle, and thorns ridge his arm, running up under the cuffs of his shirt, visible when he and Dane urge Maddock over. Oriana curtsies to them. Although Dane and Balakin are standing together, they are often at odds with each other and with their sister Eloin so often that the court is considered to be divided into three warring circles of influence. Prince Balakin, the firstborn, and is said are known as the Circle of Grackles, for those who enjoy merriment and who scorn anything getting in the way of it, they drink themselves. Sick and numb themselves with poisonous and delightful powders. 
His is the wildest circle, although he has always been perfectly composed and sober when speaking with me. Capital I. Suppose I could throw myself into debauchery and hope to impress them. I'd rather not, though. Princess Ilone, the second born, and her companions have the circle of larks. They value art above all else. Several mortals have found favor in her circle, but since I have no real skill with a lute or declaiming, I have no chance of being one of them. Prince Dane, third born, leads what's known as the circle of falcons. Knights, warriors, and strategists are in their favor. Matic, obviously, belongs to this circle. They talk about honor, but what they really care about is power. I am good enough. With a blade, knowledgeable in strategy, all I need is a chance to prove myself. Go enjoy yourselves, Maddock tells us. With a look back at the princess, Taryn and I head out into the throng. The palace of the King of Elfheim has many secret alcoves and hidden corridors, perfect for trysts or assassins or staying out of the way and being really dull at parties. When Taryn and I were little, we would hide under the long banquet tables, but since she determined we were elegant ladies, too big to get our dresses dirty crawling around on the floor, we had to find a better spot. Just past the second landing of Stone Steps is an area where a large mass of shimmering rock juts out, creating a ledge. Normally, that's where we settle ourselves to listen to the music and watch all the fun we aren't supposed to be having tonight. However, Taryn has a different idea. She passes up steps and grabs food off a silver tray a green apple and a wedge of blue vein cheese. Not bothering with salt, she takes a bite of each, holding the apple out for me to bite. Oriana thinks we can't tell the difference between regular fruit and fairy fruit, which blooms a deep gold. Its flesh is red and dense, and the cloying smell of it fills the forests at harvest time. The apple is crisp and cold in my mouth. We pass it back and forth, sharing down to the core, which I eat in two bites. Near where I am standing, a tiny fairy girl with a clock of white hair, like that of a dandelion, and a little knife cuts the strap of an ogre's belt. It's slick work. A moment later, hi. Sword and pouch are gone, she's losing herself in the crowd, and I can almost believe it didn't happen. Until the girl looks back at me, she winks. A moment after that, the ogre realizes he was robbed. I smell a thief, he shouts, casting around him, knocking. Over a tankard of dark brown beer, his warty nose sniffing the air. Nearby, there is a commotion in honor of the candles flares up. In blue crackling flames, sparking loudly and distracting even the ogre. By the time it returns to normal, the white-haired thief is well gone. With a half-smile, I turn back to Taryn, who watches the dancers with longing, oblivious to much else. We could take turns, she proposes. If you can't stop, it'll pull you out. Then you'll do the same for me. My heart beats beats at the thought. I look at the throng of revelers, trying to build up the daring of someone who would rob an ogre right under his nose. Princess Eloan whirls at the center of a circle of larks. Her skin is a glittering gold, her hair the deep green of ivy. Beside her, a human boy plays the fiddle. Two more mortals accompany him less skillfully, but more joyfully, on ukuleles. Eloan's younger sister Kelia spins nearby, with corn silk hair, like her father's and a crown of flowers in it. A new ballad begins, and the words drift up to me. Of all the sons King William had, Prince Jamie was the worst. They sing. And what made the sorrow even greater? Prince Jamie was the first. I've never much liked that song because it reminds me of someone else. Someone who along with Princess Raya, doesn't appear to be attending tonight. Butano, 
I do see him. Prince Cardan, sixth born to the High King Eldred, yet still, the absolute worst, strides across the floor toward us, Valerian, Nicasia, and Lakaha's three meanest, fanciest, and most loyal friends follow him. The crowd parts and hushes, bowing as they pass. Cardan is wearing his usual scowl. Accessorized with coal under his eyes and a circlet of golden, his midnight hair. He has on a long black coat with a high, jagged collar, the whole thing stitched with a pattern of constellations. Valerian is in deep red, cabochon rubies sparkling. On his cuffs, each like a drop of frozen blood, Nicasius hair is. The blue-green of the ocean, crowned with a diadem of pearls. A glittering cobweb net covers her braids. Locke brings up the rear, looking bored, his hair the precise color of fox fur. Fear ridiculous, I say to Taran, who follows my gaze. Capital I. Cannot deny that they're also beautiful. Fairy lords and ladies, just like in the songs. If we didn't have to take lessons alongside them, if I didn't know firsthand what a scourge they were to those who displeased them, I'd probably be as in love with them as everyone else is. Vivi says that Cardan has a tail, Taran whispers. She saw it when she was swimming in the lake with him and Princess Raya this past full moon night. I can't imagine Cardan swimming in a lake, jumping in the water, splashing people, laughing at something other than their suffering. A tail? I echo. An incredulous smile starting on my face and then fading when I remember that Vivi didn't bother to tell me the story, even though it must have happened days ago. Three is an odd configuration of sisters. There's always one on the outside, with a tuft on the end. It coils up under his clothes and unfurls like a whip. She giggles, and I can barely understand her next words. Vivi said she wishes she had one. I am glad she doesn't, I say firmly which is stupid. I have nothing against tails. Then Cardan and his companions are too close for us to safely talk about them. I turn my gaze to the floor, though I hate it. I sink to the ground on one knee, bend my head, and grit my teeth. By my side, Taran does something similar. All around us, people are making obeisances. Don't look at us, I think. Don't look. As Valerian passes, he grabs one of my braided horns. The others move on through the throng as Valerian sneers down at me. Did you think I didn't see you there? You and your sister. Stand out in any crowd, he says, leaning in close. His breath. Is heavy with the scent of honey wine. My hand balls into a fist at my side and I am conscious of the nearness of my knife.